Hello everybody, once again this is Greg. I want to do a, a super quick video today on a particular topic of animal sacrifices and how that relates to the death of Yeshua. Um, there's a good chance that most of us probably believed at some point that in the Old Testament people had to sacrifice animals to receive forgiveness of sins, but then Jesus came and he died so that no more animals had to, an animal sacrifice has been done away with. Uh, let's take a look and see what Scripture actually says about this particular topic. I've got Hebrews 10. Let's read verses 1 through 4. It says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, uh, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Here's the kicker, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So really focus on what I just read there. Number one, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So that is a crystal clear statement that very directly says that animal sacrifices never remove sin. If we scroll down to verse 11, it says this uh, again point blank. It says, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So the author is telling us that animal sacrifices did not stop with the death of the Messiah, and those sacrifices can never take away sins. They never did. Uh, they, they can't, and they never did, because that is actually not the point of the sacrifices. The author of uh, chapter 11 here is giving us a, a stark contrast between the offering of the body of Yeshua compared with animal sacrifices. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. Look at verse 14 here. It says, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, animal sacrifices, here's, here's the distinction between the two. Animal sacrifices are for the purification of the flesh, but they never affected the, conscious, uh, the conscience of a man. Let's back up and go to Hebrews 9 verses 13 and 14. It says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So, Notice the distinction between the two there. Animal sacrifices uh, are for the, for the purification of the flesh, and the death of Yeshua purifies our conscience. Th those are not overlapping things. They're two separate things. Um, so let's go back in time instead of me you know, just telling you what this is for, what it's not for. Let's take a look and try to answer the question, did God forgive people without requiring the death of animals? I mean, if it was required, then it should be required every time. But here in Numbers chapter 14, verses 19 and 20, Moses praying on behalf of the Israelites, he says, Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Verse 20, Then Yahweh said, I have pardoned according to your word. Okay, so Moses asks for forgiveness and God says yes. I mean, this single incident by itself actually does prove that animal sacrifice is not required for God to forgive sin. So let me put this another way. Um, sometimes throwing out kind of a ridiculous example will help you think about it. A man never could go savagely murder his neighbor and then take a bull and go to the temple and slaughter it and receive forgiveness. Um, if this were true, then a rich man who had big herds could basically get away with anything that he wanted, pay a price, and be clean. But on the flip side of that, a poor man who had no flocks would be condemned. You know, and that isn't right. 
Forgiveness only comes by heartfelt repentance. And I want to clarify, repentance does not mean asking for forgiveness. That is not what the word means. A person who is repentant changes their ways, okay? They stop breaking God's commandments and they start obeying them. That's actual repentance. Now, here's a verse that's very popular that proves that uh, forgiveness of sin is not tied to animal sacrifice. Uh, I used to hear this one all the time in church. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I mean, honestly, does anyone really think that God was ever okay with committing a deliberate sin with the expectation that all they had to do was kill a lamb and it was as if it never happened. I mean, think about what that says about our Heavenly Father. That's not just in your mind, so it there's no way that's just in His. Um, lots of scriptures because I, I want to let the Bible prove this instead of me telling you anything. Look at what Yeshua says in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. If you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So in this instant, uh, this instance, no one took up stones to kill Yeshua because he was doing away with animal sacrifices. Um, let's add another example of that, Matthew 9, 2. It says, uh, this is about a paralytic. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Yeshua saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, they did get angry this time, uh, but it, was, it, it wasn't because of um, you know him doing away with animal sacrifices. It was because they understood that only God could forgive sins, yet Yeshua is here saying, I forgive you. So this notion that forgiveness of sin uh, used to be connected to the death of an animal, it's, it's simply not biblical. And here is the kicker, okay? This is what this whole video is about, is really getting to this point. Animal sacrifices will be present in the millennium. This is a huge problem for the theology that says that Messiah's death negated animal sacrifice because the prophets over and over, uh, they prove that the sacrifices will continue. I just want to give a few verses on this. There are plenty more, but here, here's some highlighted ones. This is Isaiah 56, uh, 6 through 8. It says, And the foreigners who join themselves to Yahweh to minister to him, to love the name of Yahweh, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Here it is. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. This has not happened yet. This is a future prophecy. Uh, Yeshua rebuked the people that were selling things on the Temple Mount because uh, he said, you know, you've turned this place into a den of robbers, but it's supposed to be a house of prayer for all peoples. But if you know anything about the first century, the way that the, the Jews protected the, uh, the temple, they wouldn't let foreigners come. But this says it, it's open to everyone. So that is a future prophecy uh, that will be fulfilled in the millennium. Here are a couple more that are a little more specific. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purify of silver, purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Now that has not happened yet. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to Yahweh. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to Yahweh as in the days of old 
and as in former years. So this is saying that in the future, Yeshua is going to purify the sons of Levi. Uh, I believe it'll be the, the sons of Zadok that actually qualify for this. Uh, that's a specific lineage in that line. Anyway, um, that has not happened yet. So that's going to be a future thing. Now, even, even more specific. I could see some people seeing these and saying, oh, that's not talking about the second coming or the millennium. Well, this is unquestionable. Um, no one's going to read this and argue with that. Zechariah chapter 14 very much is the day of the Lord. Um, let's see. On, you know, on this day, the Lord will be king over all the earth. The Lord will be one and his name will be one. It talks about what sounds like nuclear war to me. Um, this is what I was getting at, verse 16. So after this great battle at his return, it says, Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem, so there we go, shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feasts of, feast of booths. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So crystal clear in the millennium, the feasts of Yahweh will continue to be in practice. Those holy days that a lot of Christians think we don't need to be doing today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Um, I am the Lord your God and I change not. There's lots of scriptures we could spit out to show that God is consistent and he doesn't change. Now, if this says point blank that uh, people will be coming up to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Booths, then we need to know how you keep the Feast of Booths. And that's recorded in Leviticus 23. Let's read 33 through 36, and you'll see, And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, and for seven days, is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you will present a food offering to Yahweh. On the eighth day, you'll hold a holy convocation and present. Now, the ESV says food offering, but the word for offering is the word, uh, I don't know the proper pronunciation for it, but it's an offering made by fire, a burnt offering. So it's not talking about, um, you know, bread or something, you know, burning bread on the altar, things like that. So it's definitely a burnt offering. Uh, so there you go. Basically, the point of it is, I, I didn't go into detail about it, but the reality is that the animal sacrifices had everything to do with the concentrated presence of God in the, the tabernacle and then in the temple. Sinful flesh could not come in the presence of a holy God. He decided, Yahweh decided that he gave us the blood for atonement. And it's like this supernatural insulation that allowed mankind, mortal man, to come close in proximity with a perfect and holy God without being burnt up. Um, so this is a system that he came up with, and people were required to offer sin sacrifices, but that's not what earned the forgiveness. The forgiveness was based on repentance and humbling themselves. Um, I wanted to go there, but for sake of time, we're going to cut the video. You can do a search in your Bible for hot, the high hand. Um, it describes, I want to say it's in uh, Numbers 15, if I'm not mistaken, but it talks about the fact that if a man commits a sin with the high hand, meaning he, you know, it's premeditated, he goes in, then scripture says his iniquity will be on him and he'll be cut off from among the people. So the sacrifices are really intended for accidents, slip ups, mistakes, you know, when people trip and fall, not for premeditated sin. Um, that's going to come up, you know, on judgment. We're going to be judged according to our works. So uh, I just wanted to put this video out to show that. Yeshua's death on the cross was not a parallel to the animal sacrifices at all. It was so much more superior and greater in every way, and it accomplished something completely different. The animal sacrifices purified this carnal flesh in relationship to us in the temple, uh, but Yeshua, his death, because of his spirit, purifies our mind and our conscience. So it's a totally different thing. Um, one did not negate the other. 
you will see the animal sacrifices restored in the millennium and they're not opposed to each other. So anyway, a short video on that topic, but I hope that clears some things up. Thanks for watching.